This is 112BK coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn. On the show today, an interview with the multi-talented author and filmmaker Nelson George. And with World AIDS Day on December 1st, how two arts organizations are honoring the stories surrounding the fight against HIV and AIDS. Hello, I'm Ashley Ford. Now, we'll be talking about the impact of the Republicans' giant tax bill next week. But with John McCain having announced his support, it's looking more and more likely that Donald Trump is finally going to get one of those wins he keeps boasting about. If and when it becomes law, who else wins remains to be seen. Meanwhile, first up today, Nelson George talks about his new novel, To Funk and Die in L.A. Then ahead of World AIDS Day on Friday, we'll hear about this year's New Fest, the annual film festival devoted to LGBTQ-centered stories, and what's happening at the Manhattan Museum called Visual AIDS. But first, some other stories we're following. A local hospital's made some national news, and not in a good way. The Brooklyn Hospital Center, right around the corner from us, is getting this attention because it turns out it was illegally billing sexual assault victims for the processing of their rape kits from 2015 to 2017. According to New York Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, 85 of the 86 exams the hospital conducted at the time were charged to the patients or their insurance company, and at least seven of those were sent to collections. Only problem is, the service is intended to be free. Schneiderman made the announcement on Tuesday as the cases were already being settled. The hospital said it would not hold the survivors responsible for the payments, and they're now able to bill the state or their insurance companies for the charges. Or if they're already paid, they'll get reimbursed. Gee, thanks. Now a couple of items from Diker Heights. Why? Because it's Christmas time, almost. The first is about Christmas decorations, and the second is about Christmas decorations. First, Diker Heights is home to a so-called Santa's Workshop, as recently profiled in the New York Times. It belongs to Lou Nasty, yep, Nasty, and it's a factory for Christmas decorations that find their way around the world. But mostly to homes in the Heights, like the 350-pound Santa meant for a front lawn display. The neighborhood, of course, is noted, or notorious, for its fabulously flamboyant Christmas spectacle. Which brings us to the second tidbit. Apparently, Diker Heights residents aren't too happy with all the revelers who come, often drunk, to take in all the lighting displays, and the giant inflatable reindeer, and the 12-foot tall snowmen. This season, the residents expect 100,000 people to come see the show, and many feel the crowds have become a nuisance. Tour buses, litter, loud music. You ask me, it's a little like the teenager who gets his whole face tattooed and then gets upset when his parents won't stop talking about it. But anyway, the community board petitioned the NYPD for increased presence and stricter traffic enforcement. But the NYPD declined. Could this spell the end of the decades old tradition? I hope not. Up next, to funk and die in LA, as told to us by Nelson George. <laughs> accuse author, cultural critic, and filmmaker Nelson George of having gone Hollywood, and in a way, you'd be correct. His most recent novel, the fourth in his D. Hunter series, unfolds in a rapidly gentrifying Los Angeles enclave, not unlike the Fort Greene of his 2012 documentary, Brooklyn Boheme. But the lifelong Brooklynite infuses plenty of hometown wit into To Funk and Die in L.A., released by Brooklyn's Akashic Books. And recently, he came by the Brick House Gallery to talk about it with Brick's senior correspondent, Brian Vines. So Nelson George, author, novelist, journalist, music journalist, anthologist, producer, film writer. So which of those things keeps you up most at night if I'm you a writer. to wear the hats? Uh, essentially, I'm a writer. And everything that I do still comes from writing, whether it's editing a, the Missy Copeland doc or uh, working on the Get Down, yeah. or uh, in the books I do. They all come from a certain kind of narrative understanding. So, you know, each medium requires different things. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the ability to write is what gets me in the door at all these places. So which of those things makes you flex the most? Well, I mean, when I'm, when I'm in trouble or when I'm emotionally, spiritually uh, unsettled, it's writing. Because you can always go back and get your notebook out and be in a subway or be in a cafe or be in bed and write. 
So when people say they're blocked, I always say that that's probably because you're trying to squeeze it out. Your subconscious is working. And the key thing is not to try and squeeze it out, but let your subconscious literally work. So what's your process then? I write by hand. Are you a person who has like the back of every envelope filled no, with notebooks. things? Notebooks, yeah. like old school, pencil yeah, paper. Yeah, black and white composition books. If you write just on computer, you write too fast. Is it? Yeah. So what's the danger in writing too fast? That you don't think it through. So uh, I write by hand, and so then I transfer it to computer. So then it basically becomes an edit. Okay. Do you do it yourself, or do you have a person who no, transfers? No. No, it's a very personal thing. Yeah. Writing. It's very your own voice, your own thing. So no. So how do you know when you're writing good versus when you're writing fast? Just you read it out loud. Once you read it out loud, you can tell the rhythm. Because it's all about rhythm. Yeah. It's all about rhythm. And if the rhythm's wrong. You can feel it, it feels rushed. I feel like if you're working on a project, or whatever that may be, it's in, it's in here. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the best way to let it come out is not to try and make it come out. Yeah. Live your life. Yeah. A big part of writing is not writing. This isn't mathematics. Yeah. It's, it's a spiritual mm -hmm. connection. And so you have to let your mind be open enough is that where the idea for this, the fourth in the series, to funk and die in LA, where did this idea come from? It comes from a variety. This book is an amalgam of a lot of different experiences. Like when I started going to LA a lot in the 80s, um, I saw that this, there was this veneer of, of success, but there's a lot of desperation, a lot of people who are not doing well. My first time in LA, I walked on Hollywood Boulevard, yeah. and they had cruising, there were cars going really slow. And they were all playing Rick James's Give It To Me. They were playing either Give It To Me Baby over and over again. Yeah. So funk was in, in pain in my mind. To your memories of LA. Uh, and uh, so all those things happened. Finally, uh, I, I lived in LA for most of, I think 2013. Mm -hmm. I worked on the get down. We were yeah. beginning the get down process for about five months. So I spent a lot of time wandering around the city. And I think that I'm very proud of the book. Is that it's, it's a really good depiction of Los Angeles as I see it, as opposed to you know, the more sparkly part. It has some sparkly parts in it, but, but the <laughs> scope of the city. But not to be confused, there is a lot of Brooklyn infused in it as well when D comes onto the scene. Right, well, he's from there, but he's a guy grappling with this new city. His father, uh, his grandfather, excuse me, uh, shop owner in Crenshaw District, yeah. traditional black neighborhood, is murdered early in the book. And he begins to unfold the sort of subterranean life of his grandfather. Yeah. So I said this to Walter Mosley, and these detective novels are really Trojan horses because there's so much social commentary yeah. infused in this thing. So I wonder, what are you sneaking in when someone's just like, I'm reading this, and you're talking about Koreatown, budding black right. historic and the Mexican influence right. as well, and what's happening in Brooklyn and all of your observations about LA. So what are you sneaking in under the guise of a well, Who done it? There, there are two things I really wanted to talk about, which was black Korean relations, which, mm -hmm. is, which is the sort of the, if there's a Chinatown thing, the black Korean relations is that subterranean yeah. thread that runs through the whole book. And then the homelessness in LA. LA has a tremendous uh, homeless problem. That's right. And it just strikes me, I, I'm, I'm always struck by seeing homeless men particularly black, black men who, who are a lot of them my age. Yeah, yeah. So I always wonder what turn happened. How did they end up here? How did they end up on the street? Yeah. What happened to their family? What happened to their loved ones? Where yeah. did that turn happen? The, it's, a, it's one of the keys to unlocking what's going on with the black community to me is the, mm -hmm. is the, the black homeless problem. Yeah. Because there's a whole wealth of men here who, some of whom really need psychiatric help. Yeah. Some of, they'd be okay if they were medication. So that's one of the subterranean threads in, into like ghosts. Funk and Dine LA. Yes. Yeah, seen and not seen. Yeah. So are you over talking about New York gentrification? Oh, for now, yeah. Yeah. It's, there's nothing I, that there's, hasn't there's, been said. There's buildings all over the place. What are you going to do? I mean, this shit is shit's done. <laughs> so what's next then? Right now we're in a curatorial mm. uh, era. Uh, whether it's like I'm doing um, in the new book, I'm doing a whole big section on funk. Okay. Because funk has gone through this whole arc where there's old black people who love certain bands and going to Tom Joyner Cruise, right? But then there's Gilda Brook and Bowl on any given night, and, and there's playing. a majority white band, Lettuce or Galactic, playing funk. Yeah. I mean, like, listen, I, I spent most of my uh, 
a great much of my years going to be in this area on Fulton Street, on the other side, I didn't really come over here. Yeah, yeah. You really didn't come on this side of, Flat, of uh, Flatbush. There was nothing over nothing here. Nothing here, yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting to, to move through it and see. I used to see a lot more ghost. Mm. I used to see a lot more ghost of my past. But now we're in such an era where, New, if you know anything about the history of New York, yeah. it's the history of transition. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, the Jews, and the, the Jews and the Italians were leaving. I didn't even know any other kind of white people existed. <laughs> I only knew Schwartz's and I knew Petrocelli's. Yeah. You know, and I knew, I knew to eat knishes and I knew to eat pizza. This other shit, what was that? I don't know what that stuff was out there, these people with like, oh, these real white names. Eh? Yeah. Because they went around me, those are the people I knew. Right. So as they began moving to the suburbs. As they became white. Yes, yeah. they moved to the suburbs and so forth. So I, I saw that whole change happen in the 70s. I lived through it into the 80s and the, and the turmoil of that. Yeah. Um, but the truth is these things are secular. Yeah. If you look at any piece of real estate in New York City, so we think this is a, you know, bed is a black community. Right. But, but there's people who think it, it was a, you know, a white community. Right, only until it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, exactly, so th these transitions are, they're wrenching for you when you live through them perhaps, but Memory, everybody has memories of what it used to be. This is the way it goes in, in, in cities like this. So I, I'm not as nostalgic, I'm nostalgic for certain moments, but I just know that everything is temporary. Yeah. Even these high rises are temporary. Well, the book is To Funk and Die in LA. The author is Nelson George. Thanks for spending some time. We Thank you. Thank you for having me. By the way, among the other three D Hunter novels Nelson George has written, there are two titles that just get me The Lost Treasures of R&B, and even better, the plot against hip hop. It's cool, right? Next up, two conversations centered around World AIDS Day and the arts. One of them is New Fest. In October, they held their 29th annual film festival here in New York. Here's a little bit of that. I'm so excited, thank you. Yes, yeah, it's great. I hope you all like the film. It's a huge deal. Yeah. It's a very big deal. It's, 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 huge it's deal. been a long time coming. I'm very, very happy that we're here now with so many people that are in the film seeing it for the first time. Yeah. Wonderful that this documentary is opening at New Fest, honoring a fabulous woman and my dear friend, Suzanne Barsh. Well, that was an amazing video. It's World AIDS Day this Friday, and while we've come a long way in fighting the stigma and ignorance too often connected with HIV and AIDS, there's still plenty of work left to do. One of the organizations working to change that narrative is NewFest, which hosted its annual film festival earlier in the fall. The organization was founded in 1988 in response to the AIDS pandemic, and that work continues to be an important part of their mission today. Here to talk about New Fest, filmmaking, and the LGBTQ community is Nick McCarthy from the organization. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nick. Thank you for having us, Ashley. So talk to me a little bit about the origin of New Fest and specifically just about the time. I mean, 1988 is really, you know, when I think about HIV and the AIDS pandemic, like my mind goes right to the 80s. Yeah. So no. I, I'm just wondering, like, the response to that being a film fest, how does that come together? No, absolutely. Um, I mean, the AIDS epidemic was, you know, such a traumatic experience for a lot of people, um, and the government wasn't really responding at the time. Um, yeah. So very much so, I think that New Fest um, was that kind of service that was needed at the time. Um, very much uh, the organizers who created New Fest mm -hmm. were the ones who thought, hey, this AIDS epidemic is absolutely abysmal, we need to do something about it. Um, there were organizations like ACT UP who were yes. doing things on a different level where you know they brought together the community, they taught people how to learn about scientific measures to actually cure AIDS perhaps, but also mm -hmm. just to speak out and become more visible. Um, the organizers of New Fest and creating and founding the whole organization and the film festival serve the whole purpose of providing a story. So you can provide mental services, any other kind of like um, physical and medical services as well. Mm -hmm. um, New Fest provides storytelling as that service. Right. Um, storytelling is wonderful. Um, just sharing Absolutely. a story really can change people's minds on everything. Mm -hmm. um, putting people in that theater and having them sit and actually feel someone else's life for that amount of time. Mm -hmm. You walk out of there two hours later and you feel like you've 
experience someone else's whole perspective. Yeah. Uh, and you start to understand more and more how hopefully you can become an ally for that. Right. So it wasn't just for the LGBT community, but also for the broad community in general wow. and the population to see these stories of LGBT characters and also to have filmmakers who are mm -hmm. LGBT and identify as such right. be able to tell their stories. So I know that the organizers are very happy to be able to provide that platform. It's like this threefold amazing thing, right? It's the LGBT filmmakers who get the mm -hmm. chance to create art and then showcase their art to people. It's the people in the audience who maybe are closely connected mm -hmm. to the epidemic who get to see their own lives or the lives of people they knew reflected in the films. Mm -hmm. And there's also people like me who don't necessarily, you know, have a person that they knew or have known who's dealt with this, mm -hmm. but I can go there and I can see the narrative built from the people who've actually lived through it. Yeah. And I get a whole other perspective. Absolutely, yeah. And as we've had like an evolving landscape in the LGBTQ community, um, mm -hmm. there have been a lot of breakthroughs. Um, there have been a lot of fallbacks. Um, mm -hmm. So being able to have these stories and see how this festival and organization has grown over 30 years through ups and downs is really magnificent. Um, when I look at the programming, because we have all the print programs still, mm -hmm. and we scanned all of them, so I like look through them whenever I'm bored, kind of, and I right. start to get ideas about like what we showed in the early 90s and what mm -hmm. we're showing now. And what I love so much about that is that we've adapted to the times, right. um, and that filmmakers are now having these wonderful documents that we want to present to new audiences too. And it's right. not just about the audience interpreting what they're seeing on screen and taking in these stories, mm -hmm. but the filmmakers being able to see in an audience of 500 people, right. they walk out and they see that filmmaker and they're like, I hear you. Um, and that's really what it is. It's about providing that kind of voice and visibility. There's a diversity of stories here, right? Like, yeah. it's not all about AIDS, it's not all about HIV, mm -hmm. um, but it's all connected to the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. One of the films that I saw you guys are going to have, there's 195 Lewis, mm -hmm. uh, which actually we had the director of that on She's here. Great, yes, no. Can you tell me some of the highlights from October? What were some of the best moments of the film? <sighs> wow, well, we had over 500 submissions this year, which was a record for us, and they came mm -hmm. from 34 countries as well. So you wow. Wow. More of an international perspective, too, because um, actually our audience award winner for Best Narrative Short mm -hmm. uh, is called Priya. Uh, it's mm -hmm. from Indonesia. There are still laws that criminalize homosexuality yes, in absolutely. Indonesia. So having that story be given this award and be able mm -hmm. to be seen further and further is something that I find extremely significant. Um, beyond that, 195 Lewis is one of my favorite films, actually, and yeah. in a web series. Um, what we yeah. wanted to do is go beyond just having our U.S. narrative, our international narrative, our documentary features. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of great shorts programs, but what we did this year, too, is broaden our episodic showcase, mm -hmm. because I think that web series right now, it's that kind of DIY sensibility, and also you have limited resources sometimes when yes. you don't have, like, huge funders. Right. And you just want to get your story out. Yes. And so web awesome. series are a great way to sort of create your own mm -hmm. narrative and then distribute yourself. And I'd say sort of opening night was a blast. So yeah, it's always of opening course. night that you remember. <laughs> it's sort of like, oh my God, and it goes by and you spend all this time planning and on opening right. night it's like, all right, here we go into the, you know, insanity. Mm -hmm. And I was so happy that our opening night went so, so well. Um, we showed the film Suzanne Barsh on top, mm -hmm. um, which is from a dynamic duo um, and partner queer filmmakers, uh, yeah. Anthony and Alex. And it was their debut film, and the film profiles Suzanne Barsh, mm -hmm. who is a legendary nightlife icon. Absolutely. Yeah, and also, yeah. Um, in the 80s, she hosted the um, Love Ball, mm -hmm. which all proceeds went to benefiting um, AIDS research mm -hmm. and everything like that. Everything that was included in any kind of, um, you know, progress made in making AIDS visible as well. Wow. Yeah, and she also discovered RuPaul. That is... <laughs> she's done a lot for the community, pretty much. And she's done a ton for I the know. community. And like, it just seemed like a perfect opening night, too, because Suzanne is a person that provided that platform right. for other people. Mm -hmm. So Suzanne is someone who was like, here we go. Here's my show. Now, here are 10 people who I just want you to know about. Don't, right. don't focus on me. I'm over here. So here are these 10 people. So as a new fest, I sort of see an analog between that mm -hmm. and the fact that we don't want to just take like a glamorous, like, head of the table. We want to set the table people. and then ask everyone else questions. That's wonderful. And yeah. thank you so much for being here today and talking to us about this. Yeah. Can't wait to have you back to talk about what you guys are up to next year. Absolutely. I'll be back. See you then. In just a moment, alternate endings, radical beginnings. No, it's not someone's wish fulfillment for the end of the Trump presidency. It's an exciting program from Visual Aids, and we'll hear about it next. <laughs> In 2000,
2016, almost 40,000 people in the U.S. received a diagnosis of HIV. Of this population, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, more than 16,000 were African American, more than double the number for either Latinos or whites, both with around 7,500 cases. Because there's such a preponderance of black people who are HIV positive or who have AIDS, the New York organization Visual AIDS is recognizing their stories with a video program called Alternate Endings, Radical Beginnings. Joining me with the details is Esther McGowan, executive director of Visual AIDS. It's great to have you here in the studio, Esther. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Can you tell me a little bit about why the organization is called Visual AIDS? Sure. Um, it was started in 1988. Uh, at the height of the AIDS crisis, and it was started by people working in the arts, and the idea was to um, find a way to help and look at a lot of the loss that was happening in the arts community specifically. Right. Um, many, many artists were dying really quickly, uh, very young. They didn't have estates. They didn't have often families who were willing to um, work to keep their artwork um, in the public eye safe. Mm -hmm. um, protected, so um, a group of arts administrators um, decided to create an organization that really focused on art and HIV AIDS at the time, and it was twofold. It's about preserving artwork, which is something that we do still to this day. We have an online artist registry. Originally it was an archive that was slides, because that's what people had back then. Right. Um, we're a, a small organization. We don't have a physical space, so we don't keep work. We keep images of work. So now it's all digital, oh, wow. online, and people can go to visualaids.org and look at our artist registry and see many, many thousands of images by mm -hmm. HIV-positive artists all over the world, some who've passed away, but many who are living today and still creating work. Work. That's one part of what we do. We also then look at how art can be used for advocacy and activism around HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, at the height of the crisis when the organization was founded, it was about this kind of very, um, almost an, an emergency feeling of right. the need to, to create activism. And um, we worked with artists like Glenn Ligon and mm -hmm. Barbara Kruger and John Giorno to create these, uh, what we call broadsides, which are eight and a half by 11 black and white sheets that mm -hmm. at the time were actually photocopied um, wow. so that they could be mass distributed for free um, that uh, use the artwork of these amazing artists to actually do a call to action for people, whether mm -hmm. it's about getting tested, a hotline you could call, or just reminding people about the AIDS crisis. Wow. Um, and so that aspect of our work has continued to this day. And what we've done is, you know, it's not, it's a different type of crisis now. It's still a crisis. Yeah. People aren't dying in the way that they were, so it's become about other things. So mm -hmm. we look at contemporary issues that are really pressing, like HIV. What are some of those? Sure, HIV criminalization is uh -huh. one of them. Um, many people don't even know that people can actually be sent to prison for as long as 30 years for transmitting HIV right. in different circumstances in many states. Every state has a different law. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that we're very concerned with now, that we're looking at um, you know, ways we can use art activism mm -hmm. to uh, just enlighten people, first of all, about this, because many people don't even know. Yeah, I um, think a lot of people don't know. Yeah. A friend of mine, Stephen Thrasher, did an amazing piece with BuzzFeed um, with a man uh, who went by, I believe, Tiger was his first name, mm -hmm. based out of Kentucky, mm -hmm. I believe. And he was a man who was being, uh, like, he was up for life sentences yeah. Yeah. Uh, for transmitting the AIDS virus or for HIV, yeah. which was terrifying and something mm -hmm. that before reading that piece I didn't know mm -hmm. was anything that could happen. And I think there are a lot of gaps in people's knowledge around AIDS and HIV. Absolutely. Um, something that I actually didn't know about you guys was that you're responsible for the Red Ribbon campaign. We are. That's something a lot of people don't know. Um, the, it's funny because the Red Ribbon has become so ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. So you think it's just, it exists and it's a, it's right. a symbol of HIV and AIDS, it's a symbol of awareness. But um, it was actually created by artists that were part of what was called the Visual AIDS Artist Caucus. That was mm -hmm. in 1991. And um, the idea was that at the time it was uh, the first Iraq war. Mm -hmm. And there were yellow ribbons tied around trees, the sort of classic tie yellow ribbon, uh, right. that was for the soldiers. And the AIDS activism organizations and groups and artists thought, well, there should be something for AIDS because it's mm -hmm. a war. You know, everyone's talking about the Iraq war. They're not talking about right. the war that's happening against people who are living with AIDS at home. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a time of very little government action. There were not medications. So it was, um, you know, it really felt like a war for people that were fighting it. And so they created a red ribbon. And the idea was that um, instead of yellow, we use red. It's a 
both about love, but it's also mm -hmm. about anger. At the yeah. time, there was a lot of anger. And, How could there not be? Yeah, absolutely. And so a group of artists that were called the Visual AIDS Artist Caucus mm -hmm. sat around a table and just kind of thought of this and the, the shape and how it's folded. And there used to be something called ribbon bees, where they would get a group of people together and just make hundreds and hundreds of these ribbons to give away. Wow. And the, the exciting thing that happened at the time, and the reason it became so well known, was it launched at the Tony Awards that mm. year in 91. We did a, um, a, a wonderful partnership with Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS, which is mm. an amazing organization. And they still fund and support us to this day. So they're great. We love yeah. them. And um, so they partnered um, with the Tonys so that famous actors like Jeremy Irons were wearing the red ribbon mm -hmm. uh, throughout that event. And that's how it actually was launched. And people noticed it and saw it for, for the first time. That's amazing. Yeah, and it, the, the thing that's interesting about it, too, is, and one of the reasons that the people don't know it's a visual aids project, mm -hmm. is it was not copyrighted, and that was intentional. Right. And you think about the way it's used now, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, and we might, you know, be in a $10 million organization if we Absolutely. had taken money for it, but we didn't because it was about sharing things for free. This was about activism. Speaking of sharing things for mm -hmm. free, you guys have an event here tomorrow, or a launch, an installment with We Brick. do, with Brick. Um, Brick is, a, once again, a partner for us. Uh, we love working with Brick. Mm -hmm. um, we do an event um, every year, actually going back to 1989, mm -hmm. called Day Without Art. And it is, was launched as um, an idea as a way to bring art and the idea of the loss of um, the loss that was happening in the art world mm -hmm. to the audience for World AIDS Day. Right. And so uh, we called it Day Without Art. And um, originally it was um, very much about loss so, and mourning. So uh, we asked museums to close their doors, to cover up artworks, to take artworks off the wall. Mm -hmm. um, the sort of famous moment was the Guggenheim actually put a black shroud over the Frank Lloyd Wright building. Wow. Um, one of the first years, which is kind of an amazing visual. Mm -hmm. And then over the years, it's changed as the AIDS crisis has changed. So now it's about creating art and creating new work that addresses some of the issues we were talking about, things right. like criminal Mm -hmm. um, so what we've done this year, and we've commissioned seven filmmakers mm -hmm. to make short films. They're seven-minute films. The whole program is about an hour. And what we did is um, ask them to center mm -hmm. the black narrative in HIV and AIDS. Right. Um, these are all black artists and filmmakers who are the creators. Mm -hmm. um, we also worked with two amazing curators to curate these artists, Erin um, Christoval, who's a curator based in LA. She's now at the Hammer Museum. Mm -hmm. And Vivian Crockett, who's here in New York. She's currently working at the Museum of Modern Art. Wow. And um, together, they worked with these artists to commission these amazing films. And we only the only sort of instruction we gave to the artists was that it was about centering the black narrative. And it had right. to relate to HIV and AIDS. But beyond that, they were given full freedom to do whatever they wanted. That's amazing. And if I want to see that, what time do I need to come here? I do? believe it is on a continuous loop on mm -hmm. the stoop from 1 to 6 Excellent. on December 1st. Excellent. And well, um, people should check the Brick website, just to be sure. Yes. But um, I'm sure that that's the, the time. Thank you so much for being here. Of I course. wish we had more time, because there's so much to say. Yeah, no, I but really. we'll have you back. I really enjoyed being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK. Thanks for joining us on 112BK. Next week, that ongoing controversy over what to do with the Bedford Union Armory, what the GOP tax bill could mean for graduate students, and Borough President Eric Adams. The beep right here at Brick House. Have a great weekend. Mm -hmm.